Hey guys, this is your High Fist and welcome once again to Ruthenbad University. I'm here with lecture 3 of our Quick Bend certification course, so please be seated for class. Today's lecture focuses on two important scenes that give us a lot of introductory insight once again into the Quick Bend character and which also answer some of the questions we raised in the previous lecture. To quickly recap what's happened so far, Quick Ben and company have given Tattersale a package and she then went back to her camp. By the time we come to our present scenes today, we already know that what was in there was a puppet and that Hairlock is now a creepy marionette of some kind that wants vengeance against Teshren. We also know from the way our previous lecture ended that the bridge burners have now been ordered to march to some legendary city known as Darujistan. The scenes that we look at today are a bit of a contrast to what we covered earlier. The introductory, uh, introductory scene that we saw in the previous lecture, that was full of intrigue, mystery, action. It was a very complex scene with many different characters being juggled. Tattersail, Whiskey Jack, Sorry, Hairlock, Kalam and of course Quick Ben. It was also the immediate aftermath of a spectacular battle and there was this aura of mystery over what the bridge burners were doing. The scenes we will explore today are different in the sense that they give us a lot more exposition and detail. Ericsson has his usual show don't tell style but many pieces of the puzzle are given more context in these two scenes that we will look at today. So the next time we get a quick bend scene is days after what we saw in, in uh, the second lecture. Ben, Kalam and Whiskey Jack are now back on that small hill that we saw them in earlier, the slope from which we saw uh, sort of the carnage of the Siege of Pale where Tattersail was standing. Things have been more or less cleaned up now and the three of them are engaged in a very intense conversation. What is clear is that Whiskey Jack is still not convinced that there's some giant conspiracy to wipe out the bridge burners. While Quick Ben and Kalam keep insisting that there is. They are 100% sure that Teshren and maybe even Lassine are trying to wipe out the bridge burners. Whiskey Jack even asks them the question that we have, which is why? He's like, why would she want to kill us? Why would they want to eliminate us? And Quick Ben and Kalam are like, She's wiping out the old guard. She's wiping out all the names who are still loyal to the emperor's memory, the old emperor whom Lassine betrayed. But Whiskey Jack doesn't bite at all. He's like, look, nobody even remembers the emperor anymore apart from Dujek and I. There's no reason for her to start killing us so many years after the emperor was killed. So his gut is telling him that there's no grand conspiracy here. But these two, Kalam and Quick Ben, are very, very adamant about it. And they're also like, they're now sending us a new captain all the way from Unta. He's probably going to get us killed. Kalam claims that he checked with some of his old contacts as well and that somebody higher up has marked the bridge burners for death. So they're waiting for Captain Paran to come and the two of them are trying to convince Whiskey Jack that there is a conspiracy. So that's their first problem. Uh, and there's this uh, the disagreement as well. The second problem, which is an offshoot of the first, is what to do about Sorry. As we saw in the previous scene, Quick Ben is terrified of her. And he even says, I never believed in pure evil until Sorry showed up. And they have this interesting conversation over whether she could be a claw or not, which is Lassine's personal assassin army. Of course, we know that those two gods we saw at the beginning have taken control of this poor girl and that the uh, patron god of assassins or whatever has now sort of possessed her and has sent her here as a weapon against Lassine. But these guys have no idea about that yet. They just know that there's something really off with her. And Kalam says she's too young to be a member of the claw. So when he said that, I was like, all right, okay, so maybe there's some redeeming feature about these Malazans after all. Uh, maybe they don't use kids because she's like 15 or 16. So 
I was like, fair play to the Malazans for not using child soldiers. And then Kalam's like, oh, they get them when they're about five or six. They're then brutally trained for 15 years nonstop. And then they're sent out as claw members. So it's not that the Malazans don't use child soldiers. They do take kids as young as five and six and then train them for a decade and a half before they use them as uh, members of the claw. So I was like, let me get this straight. These are supposed to be the good guys whom we've just seen. We've just seen them slaughter their own soldiers as collateral damage. We've seen them allow their allies walk in and commit mass murder, the Morant. We've seen them invade another country for no reason other than the accumulation of power and wealth. And now we also find out that they use child soldiers. So why are they the good guys again? I have no idea. So all of these things made me like Quick Ben ironically even more because him and Kalam are the only ones who are like, fuck this evil empire. They're fucking everyone around us. They're fucking us. So let's fuck them back. But then we get a little bit of insight into what exactly the plan with Hairlock is as well. The quote Quick Ben uses is, he says, Hairlock is our snake in the hole. So he's clearly trying to use Hairlock as some kind of secret weapon against the Malazan Empire, particularly against Teshren. They're trying to use Hairlock as some kind of spy to figure out who is doing what and to collect evidence on whatever this conspiracy is. So this raises an interesting question. Why Hairlock? Is it because he's now a puppet and therefore it's easier for him to sneak around? Does he possess some kind of magical ability that Quick Ben doesn't? which would be strange given how knowledgeable Quick Ben seemed to be in the previous scene? Or is it because Hairlock has some kind of inherent advantage against Teshren? Maybe he knows the Imperial High Mage for a while and therefore has some special knowledge to get past his defenses. Who knows? Whatever it is, at this point, what we know is that they intend to use Hairlock as a spy. Whiskey Jack is then like, okay, so you use Hairlock as a spy, but what happens when you actually come face to face with Teshren? The guy just fought a, a flying mountain and an, an alien army by himself. What on earth are you guys going to do? And Quick Ben smiles again and is about to give him a brilliant answer. And Whiskey Jack's like, oh, wait, 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 don't tell me. I already know what you're going to say. When you need to fight something nasty, you make a deal with something even scarier. Am I right? And Quick Ben stops smiling. I thought, I thought this was a great scene because number one, it gives us more insight into Quick Ben's style of doing things. So just as we suspected from the first scene, he's an extremely cerebral guy. He prefers the cloak and dagger stuff and he doesn't really go for the face-to-face -face confrontations. It also gives us great insight into Whiskey Jack's character because he knows how his subordinate thinks. Quick Ben thinks he's going to impress his boss with that answer, but the boss is like, I know exactly what you're going to say, and then lays down exactly what Quick Ben was about to say. And then Whiskey Jack says something which I think for the purposes of analyzing Quick Ben is the most important line in this entire scene. He says, and I quote, Back in the seven cities, I led the company chasing you across the desert. He says, I know how you work and I know you're good, but all your partners were dead by the time you were done. So what about this time? And these two or three lines once again raise an entire universe of new questions. Was Quick Ben originally an enemy of the Malazan Empire? It certainly seems so because we're told by the kid in the prologue, uh, Paran in the prologue, that Dasim, who's a kind of general of the Malazan army, was killed in the Seven Cities. So did Quick Ben have something to do with that war and that campaign that the Malazans ran in the Seven Cities? We don't know. Was he some kind of high-ranking mage? It certainly seems so if a legend like Whiskey Jack led the chase against him. Did he kill the rest of his cabal? Whiskey Jack doesn't say that directly, but he is kind of implying that Quick Ben was responsible for their deaths in some way. And Whiskey Jack also knows that Quick Ben suffers a little bit of guilt from this over what happened because he uses it in this scene to shut him up. 
Quick Ben then looks away when Whiskey Jack says that, and Whiskey Jack's like, "All right, guys, let's get going." And the three of them move away to meet their new captain, this uh, new kid called Ganos Paran, whom we know is going to be an important character because he was the kid in the prologue. So that's the first scene with the two of them. We briefly see, sorry, with the three of them, we briefly see them again when Tatasail and Teshren are together, and they see the group from a distance. And Teshren is like, he tells Tatasail. Oh, that's Whiskey Jack's team. You know the the guys you were speaking with after the siege of Pale, and even though he doesn't make a big deal out of it, when I first read this, I was like, oh shit! So how much of the plan does Tashren know? If he's aware that Tata Sail spoke to them, does that mean he also knows about Hairlock? Because that's the only thing they were doing up there. It's not like they were doing anything else up there. It's not like their conversation was about anything else. Does he already know? Their entire plan. Are these guys walking into Tashren's trap? We just don't know. The next time we see Quick Ben is in Tattersail's tent. So that's Quick Ben, Whiskey Jack, Kalam, and Fiddler coming over to meet Tattersail to discuss this. And here we finally get a little more exposition that le- that sheds some light. Of course, it still raises far more questions than answers, but it gives us a little more context, as I was saying. By now, we've already had a really intense scene where Tattersail reads the deck of dragons for Tashren and stuff, and we know Hairlock is kind of crazy, and that's how the scene starts. The scene starts with Tattersail saying, "Look, guys, Hairlock is insane," and Quick Ben, he's like, "Of course he's insane. The guy's a fucking puppet now. That's to be expected." So he is not faced at all like Tattersail is by the idea of their secret weapon going insane, or rather, he doesn't want to reveal that fear to Tattersail if at all he feels that. And then we find out why uh, Hairlock's going insane and why he's being used as a weapon, which answers the question I just asked about a minute ago. So Quick Ben explains that the normal way of traveling and using magic within the Warren system. Is impossible for their particular task because Tashren would detect that immediately. But apparently, Hairlock uses the power of chaos, which is sort of apparently this dangerous space that exists between the Warrens. So the Warrens are like these tunnels, and they exist within this larger dangerous space called chaos. So think of the Warrens as these uh, highways or roads. That are built through a really dangerous forest. As long as you stick to the road and travel down the road, you can get from point A to point B. But the roads are surrounded by this really dangerous jungle called chaos, and venturing in there is extremely dangerous. If any of you have seen the movie Jurassic Park, you would kind of know what I'm talking about. In in Jurassic Park, there's a pathway and a a road of sorts for the tourists to take as they travel in that bubble. and as long as they stick to that path they can watch all the dinosaurs and traverse through the park in safety but if you get off the road you could be in big trouble so the roads are all being monitored by tashren there's no way you can get to him by driving down the normal way so this mad puppet called hairlock has gone off the road and he's now sneaking through the actual jurassic park amongst the raptors and the t-rex and all that to get to tashren if that makes sense so that's why they have to use hairlock to collect information because he's using chaos and that cannot be detected even by tashren tatasail is exasperated and she's like why are you guys pulling me into this scheme because she's not completely on board the idea either she doesn't trust these guys at all she's like look if you're worried about your safety why don't you guys just desert why don't you guys just run away with everything tashren has to worry about right now there's no way he's going to be bothered to chase you guys down and since she's smart and once again i think many have already pointed out that erickson is great at creating competent intelligent perceptive female characters right so being an ericksonian female lead character she's smart enough to be like unless tashren was right unless you guys really are planning to betray the empire and tashren simply anticipated your schemes and fouled up all your plans before you could betray him and you know what 
these guys don't seem to have a convincing counter answer when she says that. So maybe she's right. We see that Quick Ben and Kalam are pretty determined to go up against Teshren, even if Whiskey Jack wasn't convinced. We see that Quick Ben turned up with a puppet in the first scene, almost as if he knew that this was what was going to happen. So what if the actual betrayers are these guys and not Teshren? What if Teshren was simply a few moves ahead of them? We know that he knew Tattersail spoke to these guys. So maybe Teshren knew about this too. And Tattersail then asks them an even more important question. She's like, okay, let's say you use Hairlock as a spy and it's confirmed that Teshren did betray you. Let's say you find out everything you need. What then? Are you going to take on Teshren? Of course, we as the readers know that Whiskey Jack asked Quick Ben this in the previous scene as well and that he already knew what the answer was going to be because he knew Quick Ben so well. But Tattersail doesn't know, know them well, right? So to her, it's still an important question. What do you guys think you can do? She's like, what do you guys think you can do to Teshren, even if it's confirmed that he did indeed try to get you all killed? And Quick Ben says, don't worry. We aren't going to face him head on using your help. We're just going to create something to orchestrate a fall from grace. You don't have to explicitly help us. You don't have to be a part of any of this. Just watch Hairlock's back if you can. Chances are he can protect himself. But if he needs some backup, please try to protect him. That's all I need. And then she smiled and then uh, he, like Quick Ben, smiles and says, Leave Teshren to Kalam and I. I love that for some reason because whenever Quick Ben smiles, He's always about to say something really cool, whether it's about the last minute negotiations in the previous episode or what he was about to tell Whiskey Jack in the previous scene or even now. Whenever he smiles, something witty and badass is about to come out of his mouth. So how strong are these guys, uh, Kalam and Quick Ben? If Quick Ben's like, oh, leave Teshren to us. Let's see. Whiskey Jack then cuts in and he's like, look, we know it's crazy, but I trust Quick Ben. He's good at what he does. And he doesn't fuck things up too badly. So please trust us. And Tattersail reluctantly agrees because she can see that at least Whiskey Jack is an honest guy, is an honorable guy. They then discuss sorry. Quick Ben doesn't want to reveal this information at all, but Whiskey Jack orders him to reveal what he knows to Tattersail. And we know that Tattersail, when she did the, uh, the Deck of Dragons reading uh, with Teshren, she already knows that Sauri is the virgin of High House Death and also the assassin of the Warren of Shadow. So we already knew Sauri was connected to the House of Shadow since we saw those two weird gods. But now we also know that she's connected to the House of Death in some way. And we know from one of the previous scenes, I think it was in Tattersail's flashback sequence, that the god ruling over High House Death is someone called Hood. So Hood is presumably something like the Grim Reaper or Yama in Hindu mythology, presiding over the process of death itself. So are these two gods, a shadow throne and cotillion, are they working together with this entity called Hood? Why is Sauri linked to both shadow and death unless they are conspiring together for something? So Quick Ben tells her what they know. By now, he has also figured out that Sauri is connected to the Warren of Shadow in some way because she was recruited about two years ago in Itko Khan right after some really magical, major magical accident happened. We know what that is. The hounds basically slaughtered the entire coastline. So Quick Ben knows that Sauri is an agent of Shadow as well. He says he's going to be using Hairlock to gather information on her as well, not just Teshren. And here's where we get a pretty mind-blowing fact. Tattersail says, and I quote, she's talking about the Warren of Shadow, since its arrival in the deck and the opening of its warren, Shadow's path crosses the empire far too often to be accidental. Why should the warren between light and dark display such obsession with the Malazan Empire. Teshren told us earlier that it was a new warren and that its emergence a few years ago really worried him. Tattersail now says that this warren seems to be interfering with the, with the Malazan Empire 
far too much for it to just be a coincidence. And Kalam then adds, Odd, isn't it? After all, the warren only appeared following the emperor's assassination at Lassine's hand. Shadow Throne and his companion, the patron of assassins, Cotillion, were unheard of before Kelevind and Dancer's deaths. It also seems that whatever disagreement there is between how Shadow and Empress Lassine is mm, personal. So, there we have it guys. We now know who those two weird gods were at the start. So, we know from the prologue in chapter 1 that Lassine betrayed the previous emperor and his companion to become the ruler of the Malazan Empire. We know from the first scene that these two gods have some kind of grudge against Lassine and are actively working for revenge against her. We now know that the Warren of Shadow came about shortly after the previous emperor and his companion were killed. We are even specifically told that Shadow Throne and Cotillion were unheard of until the supposed death of Kelevend and Dancer. So Ericsson has essentially spoon-fed the answer to us without actually spoon-feeding it to us. But we now know that Kelevend and Dancer didn't actually die in the sense we think of. They are the two gods we saw at the beginning. Kelevend and Dancer are Shadow Throne and Cotillion. The two of them, it seems, either faked their deaths to become gods or they died and then returned somehow as gods. Hopefully, we'll get more on this later. We get some interesting info in this conversation uh, on the Warren of Shadow itself and it's important to take note of a few things in this conversation, students. So, pay attention. Tattersale says there's always been a Warren of Shadow, right? It's called Rashan. And Quick Ben immediately corrects her. He's like, oh no, that's just a fake shadow a uh, shadow warren the real one has been inaccessible for thousands of years until the emperor and dancer died and he mentions that the earliest writings say that the throne was initially occupied by a teast idur tato says like teast idur what the hell's that and quick bends like i don't know probably cousins to the tea standy or something tato doesn't really buy that quick ben doesn't know she's like you do know, but you just don't want to tell me. But she knows she isn't going to get much more info from him. But once again, he proves that his knowledge of magic and the history of magic is even superior to her own. And she herself, we know, is an encyclopedia, an adept at the deck of dragons. So who are these people called the Tea Stidur? And is Quick Ben right that they're probably connected to the Tea Standee? Perhaps we'll find out more later on. Whiskey Jack then jumps into the conversation and he's still not convinced that Sorry has something supernatural about her. But this time Tattersail interrupts him and she's like, I believe Quick Ben and Kalam. There's something definitely wrong with Sorry and there's something definitely supernatural about it. And Whiskey Jack's like, okay, then in that case, are you with us? And Tattersail says, yeah, I'm with you guys and finally agrees to come on board the plan. This entire time, Fiddler is pacing around and suddenly he's like, something's wrong, guys. And the bridge burners enter alert mode because Fiddler has some kind of instinctive danger sense. He's like Spider-Man, right? He has his spidey sense. And apparently, he's the one who saved them from the tunnels as well because he felt something was wrong. Fiddler is now like, something just happened somewhere close by and there's a bloody knife. So Whiskey Jack sends Kalam first and they get ready to leave as well. As they are leaving, Quick Ben opens up his warren. And once again, Tattersail has no idea what it is, as we saw in the previous episode. Uh, she's like, and once again, I quote, I should know you. There are not enough true masters in this world for me to not know you. Who are you, Quick Ben? So she acknowledges that there are only a few true masters of magic in the entire world. She acknowledges that she herself is knowledgeable enough to know he, uh, who each one of these masters are. And she is also acknowledging that Quick Ben himself falls into this category. And we really connect with her when she says this because we have the same question in our minds. Who are you, Quick Ben? And to cap it all off, Quick Ben just... Eh, 
huh, just shrugs in response to the question and they all leave and the scene ends so those are our two scenes for today's lecture guys as i said in the beginning even though we don't get any action we get a lot of context and we get a lot of information we know that quick ben is some kind of true master of magic the type of which there are only a handful in the entire world we find out that he used to be an enemy of the malazan empire and a mage in some cabal in the seven cities that whiskey jack had to hunt down we see that the reason they are using hairlock is because of this crazy warren called chaos and we also know that they are playing a really dangerous game because chaos disrupts the fabric of reality itself so these guys can get sucked into it at any moment if they take a step wrong they are essentially conspiring with chaos itself and we have no idea what the consequences will be on top of that we also find out from these two scenes that shadow throne and cotillion are kelvend and dancer we find out that the warren of shadow was once ruled by some creature belonging to a, some race called the tsti dur and we also find out that tashren knew about tatasail's initial meeting with the bridge burners so who knows what might come of all that so that brings our third lecture to an end guys i hope you guys enjoyed this thank you take care and i'll see you soon class dismissed